Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'm going to present some very ongoing recent work, which started in a short time. So what I'm going to present to you. Uh, <coughs> first of all, I just uh, uh, would like to recall what are Michael Jackson problem frame. I hope that you know you have already seen a problem frame. Have it, has someone already seen a problem frame? No. OK, I will try. In the, uh, during the talk, I will try to make uh, the, precise, uh, the relative information. So the problem frame is, a, is an idea that is said, when you have to do a software development job, first of all, it's nice to know very precisely which is your problem and to put on a piece of paper in a nice diagram which is, uh, is uh, present all the elements of your problem and make precise what you have to, to do and what already exists. And that's are the problem frame. So a problem frame allows to pin precise a software development problem before starting to work, just to avoid to start trying to solve the wrong problem. Moreover, if you start by drawing a nice problem frame, then you can develop a stylized method, which means instead to have a general purpose method, you have a method which works precisely for that uh, case. In this talk, I will uh, present the, a problem frame for the hybrid translation system. Hybrid translation system means a system which uh, translates data, but is hybrid since the data arrive from different sources and will have to be sent to different consumers. And then the translation can depend on the precise data and who is the producer. And looking at the data, you also can understand which is the uh, relative consumer. We call hybrid translation because it's generalization of one of the Michael Jackson problem frame, which was just a translation frame, very simple, which have one input and you have to produce one data. This is generalization because uh, you have a different input data from different producer, and then you have to translate and then so to decide to who, uh, which consumer to send. Example, why we are going to speak about them? Because a the case of hybrid translation system is the so-called hybrid mail. Hybrid mail are systems which uh, arrive files, uh, digital files, and exit uh, paper mail. Are used by so to send the bank statement, uh, invoice, uh, and so on. But another case of hybrid translation system could be a Big Brother's system filter and communication, as to filter. Uh, SMS, email, uh, translation, transcription of uh, phone call, and everything. And so the sources are different. The translation, which means to find if there are specific words or specific uh, topics, uh, could be common, but with some difference. And then the result of the translation, if there are specific words, has to be sent either to the policy or to another department or so on. Why we started to work on this? Uh, hybrid translation. The, our interest in this topic has been prompted by a cooperation with a local big company, which arrived from us and said, we have a problem to handle changes. <laughs> so we, we have a system, we have wanted to do changes, and we have a big problems because we are not able to, to make this change in a reasonable time. And their system was a, an hybrid mail system. And the, the topic is quite irrelevant because it's a very big company in Italy, precise in Genova, and is one of the most important producers of hybrid mail system in the world. So it's not a small topic. I just uh, try to say something about uh, this hybrid mail system, which is the starting point of our work. So in an hybrid mail system, we have electronic input files and uh, 
output are paper mail just already put in the envelope and, and delivered it to the postal service for uh, sending. The hybrid mail system are used by big uh, organizations to produce a big amount of physical mails which are very similar, bank statement, uh, credit card statement, uh, and so on. So indeed, uh, customers are big companies, banks, uh, that uh, use uh, hybrid mail system to send invoice. Here is just a, a small diagram showing how this works. In, we have a company, an enterprise, which has to send the paper mail. The old way was to prepare the mail and send it to the post service. Now, instead, send electronic data to the hybrid mail system, which is able to transform in printable junk, print and put in the envelope, and then deliver it to the right place in the post office, just not the, to the post, you have to decide, I go to the center in the north, in the center in the south, uh, and, and so on. And then send back uh, some invoice. So the activity are, the system receives files in various formats, PDF, XML, process them, print, physical printing, and then deliver to the right place in the post service. So these are hybrid mail system. The actual system, the legacy system where the, this company has problem which was shown to us, is something big. So more than one million line of code, 2,000 files, modules, Written using a lot of uh, languages, uh, including also stored procedure in a database, using different uh, machines, is distributed, process 100 million, um, million mails for each month, and moreover can handle several configurations, which means that the system is made by a CDA, which is a processing center, com this is the, the acronym is in Italian, which can be col connected to various printing centers, this one. And so we can have a different configuration, and the configuration can change dynamically. So when the system is running, new printing center can be added or a printing center can be closed, either temporary or definitively, because it depends on the idea of the company to maximize the so this is the system, and which is the problem that uh, was shown to us. Okay, the problem is a case of this general problem, that you have a software system which has to be kept aligned with the business. If the business changes, you have to align. But uh, in this specific case, they have a problem. They was say, okay, we have to change something, and they tar started to do the changes, and the time to deliver the change was uh, huge for them. So some case was uh, one, six months for something not uh, very big, or in some cases they was not able to change the system and they prepared a very small new stuff just to uh, under the specific case because it was uh, impossible to perform the changes. I tried to give an idea which are the changes that uh, make a problem for this company. And there are, they give us a very long list. These are the most important ones. Okay, one change, this is the easy one. The printing center can change. So new printing center can be added or someone can be closed. Okay, sometimes the input format can be arrive a new format. For example, now they are just going to tackle the problem of PDF because the system was not able to handle PDF and now they have to handle PDF. So they have to adjust to be, receive a new input. Or new printer, new kind of printer center become available. For example, they have to switch from white and black printer to color printer. Or very recently they have to change that now there are printers which can use thick paper or very light paper, and so they have to handle also this new feature. 
or sometimes uh, the client say that I want to add a small derived functionality. For example, a very simple functionality, which they have printed this envelope. The client say, okay, give me a report, which is the number of envelope, and how many pages it was inside each envelope. This simple, quite simple change took six months to be implemented. Or sometimes you have a very big change because the, the domain, the regulation of the domain change. For example, in Italy, just two years ago, it was possible to have a private mail. Before, there was only the official state-based mail. Now there are private companies doing mail service. And private companies have a very different way to organize the distribution of the mail. So the system has to adjust to this uh, new way to distribute. For example, private companies don't serve as small villages. And so they was uh, to change completely the way to route the mail. This is the most uh, incredible case. Client wanted a simplified variant of the system. So the system was receiving some file, doing some elaboration, then printing them. Well. The client said, OK, I do the elaboration. I give just the file ready to be printed and distributed. They was not able to implement this change. So the, the, their solution was just I do a new ad hoc system. And then there are more. So these people say, we have this problem. We want to, that you help us. Uh, so for example, could be passing to object-oriented technology uh, an improvement, and so on. And then what I'm going to present now is one, our initial attempt. This is a very recent stuff since the company presented everything just before Christmas. So, so we would like to investigate and to propose some solution for the problem. We want to develop a system which can be suitable, to, can be robust with respect to changes. First of all, just a small classification of changes. Changes are not of the same nature. We have devised three categories of changes. Changes which go in the category of context awareness. So if the system has to take in account that the context it changes, OK, this is one kind of changes. They usually are the easy one. For example, in the case of the hybrid mail system, the number of printer center can change. So the system has to react to these changes because uh, if uh, now there is a, a new printer center near to the place uh, where the mail are to be sent, okay, use them. If someone is close, uh, you have to readjust the distribution. And this is the classical case of context awareness. A difference of a lot of talk that have been in this workshop there is no need to react on real time. So this is a system which when you have to do some change, you can close and then start again. Then we see a kind of a pro, we call proactive standard changes. If you have a system, you can, when you are devising, develop your system, you can imagine that there could be a lot of changes which sometimes the client can ask to you, or you can just go to the client and say, OK, do you want these changes? Which are these standard changes? So the, the thing that can be naturally inside the system can be changed. For example, this is a simple case. You have a system. You should think that you can be asked to have a simplified version, eliminate some functionality, or simplify the functionality. Is it, you should imagine that some, at a certain point, someone can ask to uh, record the information on what you are processing. So for example, to do some business intelligence analysis. In the case of a hybrid mail system, it could be nice to record uh, all companies sending mail, uh, which uh, the number of error in their file, and so on, to decide if, if someone is a good client or a bad client, and so on. Login feature. It could be asked to log the various operations made in the system, either for security or just for monitoring to see what is happening, how many jobs are uh, 
under execution and so on. So this is for us is a kind of a proactive change in, in the sense that already in the system there is the, uh, the information to perform these changes. And a good developer perhaps could start to think, okay, I try to sell to the client this uh, extra functionality. And then we are the unpredictable. <laughs> this, there is no way, so you can do the best of your uh, development, but you cannot predict this change. For example, that uh, the, the new changes in the domain, the change in the requirement, uh, and we have this uh, kind of new print standard, new printer technology, private mail, new rules. And to cope with, the, with them, you just need to develop your system in a very good way to be ready to anything, because anything can happen, really. OK, so this is the kind of changes. Then what is our solution? Not a solution, just a, an attempt. We use this uh, uh, slogan, developing for changes. Up to now, there is the design for changes, but it's covered only the design activity. We think uh, this idea of uh, do the thing knowing that you can be required to change in the future should cover all the development uh, activity, and we use developing for changes. So, uh, this case of the hybrid mail system call for developing for changes approach. And uh, OK, we are going in a completely different direction of uh, the agile development, uh, which uh, uh, say that uh, not even designing for changes is good. In the reality, we have to say that the people that have developed this leg, uh, actual system made everything the contrary of developing for changes, and made everything which uh, can be done to have something which is really difficult to change. So our idea is developing for changes, which means a kind of a guideline idea and then some practical method which put this idea in. Yeah. So we base our job, our idea, classical key idea, structure, documentation, but here we need high level documentation, not only to be documented the high level phase, but the documentation with the high level information know how. So to have a, perf a code perfectly commented is not enough in this case. We should have, the, instead to have information in the code, to have high level information. Abstraction, type, encapsulation, all the well known stuff. But uh, we have something new that developing for change is different from designing for change. Generative techniques. So not to put everything wired uh, in the code, but use an indirect way. So put something from which you can derive, and then you have use this kind of generative techniques. This is, for us, the key idea to be able to handle the changes. And then, so these are the idea. At this point, I can start a very philosophical talk, speak about this idea. But we prefer to go in a more concrete. So we want to solve the case of hybrid mail system, but we consider the hybrid translation frame, a problem frame in the Michael Jackson. Just uh, not just an example, and not even speaking of the problem of changes in the full generality. So we decided that the problem frame is the right level where to speak about the an attempt of solution of the problem of the changes. So not to be too specific in just one case study, but not even to be under the complete generic case. And the problem frame already offers some helps, because you have to fill the frame, you have to just to do an initial structuring and initial documentation of your problem. And so you have the starting point to be able to cope with the changes. And moreover, the problem frame is the right level where to propose a tailored development methods for handling the changes. We are not giving the silver bullet. In the previous edition of the Monterey Workshop, there has been a lot of discussion of this silver bullet. Not a silver bullet, but something which can be effective, can help really. At the center extent, it can give some help. OK, so 
now I'm going to present the translation frame and how this idea of developer can, for changes can be embedded in this specific case. Here is the problem frame diagram. <laughs> Michael Jackson said that any problem in development, uh, any problem of develop, software development can be represented in one diagram of this kind, where we have uh, domains, which are the boxes, we have uh, this machine, the machine which has the two lines, which is what you have to develop. These are existing already. You don't have to develop. You cannot change. And then you have the requirement, which are related these domains with other and describe what the machine should be should done. Okay. In the hybrid translation frame, we have a producer and consumer. These are co causal given domains. What means that the causal means that they are able to autonomous behavior, so that they are autonomous entity, and they are given in the sense that there exist and you cannot change. You have to develop your system, taking them as a given. And we have many producer of different kind and many consumer of different kind. Then we have the input data and the output data, which are lexical domain, already given domain, since the input data and the output data are given, you cannot change them. And there are lexical means data. We have no, they have no uh, behavior, no dynamic behavior. And we have the requirement. The requirement in this case is the rules of the translation, which links an input data, its producer, with an output data and the consumer to who the data has to be sent. And finally, we have the machine. That is what we have to develop, the translator system. These are the connection between the, these two domains and this other, and say that uh, the producer send some input data to the uh, machine, and the machine passes some output data to some consumer. So this is the schema, the frame of our problem. Okay, this is uh, for who knows the, the uh, problem frame uh, by Michael Jackson is an extension to the original notation. Michael Jackson presented in his book uh, some basic uh, problem frame. These are more complex, so we have uh, to extend uh, the notation. That is uh, a three-way interaction, while in Michael Jackson there was only a pairwise uh, interaction. OK, which are some key idea of this uh, method of which uh, under the idea of developing for changes for the, this problem frame? First, uh, the part uh, concerning domain modeling. We have seen in this diagram, we have producer, consumer, input, and output data. These are domain. It's the domain of the system. We need to model them as a first step in the development. So if you have to go for changes, when you model this uh, domain, you have to look for commonalities. Try to present in, a, uh, in some sense it's say, OK, I have uh, several of them, but a, a part is common to all of them. So there is a, an abstract a domain, then there are specialization. This is the, a good uh, idea to be able to accommodate a new kind of uh, domains if uh, they are changed, or to eliminate if some domain is not anymore used, it is easy to change. For example, in this case, we have uh, at a certain point, we can have a printer sentence in black and white, a gray scale. If uh, we try to have the common part of all printer send and then to specialization, could be easier to introduce a color or a printer. OK, and again, we needed to introduce a specialization in the domain of Michael Jackson. Requirement. How to present the requirement for the translation frame in a way that will help to cope with the changes? So we assume that the translation rule should be expressed as a composition of function, also of higher order function. Why in this way? So in some sense, you are going to structure your uh, translation. You say that the translate is to be made by composite function. And some of this function will be used in various of this translation. 
this uh, for us is a good way to have a way to decompose the requirement, to be able to trace the requirement in the design, and to be able to change them. And so we one of our uh, key ideas is that uh, the translation rule should be expressed in terms of translation function. In general, uh, for example, you can make also the requirement by means of uh, property logical form. Logical form are not uh, a nice way to be able to cope with the changes later. Then another point is separating the routing from the data transformation. So in the trans hybrid translation frame, data has to be transformed, and then you have to decide to which consumer to uh, send them. Separating these two parts. For example, one of the problems of this actual system was that uh, the routing was made together the translation. So when we have uh, to separate, uh, you have already the translated data, and you have uh, want just uh, to route them, you was not able to do. So see, I assume that uh, when you look at this and say, OK, it's quite obvious, not a very exciting idea. But uh, the fact that it was not followed, this simple idea, make a really big problem with a lot of lose of money. OK, assuming that we do uh, uh, in translate the requirement in terms of function does not mean that our requirements are low level because some of these function can in the end, the basic function can in the end uh, presented by means of pre post condition. Okay, this is uh, design. So, how to this is the most important part. To be able to cope with change at the design level, the basic key idea is requirement traceability. So the requirement should be easily to be traced in the design. Requirements are expressed in translation and function. So this should be the translation function should appear in the design directly. So one idea. Then another key idea. Raise the code instantiated knowledge to an explicit parameterized level. So don't put anything weird in the code. Uh, this is uh, just a generalization of this uh, very well known typical case. Say, it's not nice to put a numerical constant in your code. Just introduce a constant, give a name, and then use the constant. OK, this idea should be uplifted to not just a to numerical constant, but a really big data structure. This was not followed by these people, and then it's a, a terrible problem. And so we needed this uh, specific uh, constant uh, data structure, which uh, can be the content of uh, something which has to be stored in a database, so something really big, but uh, should be abstracted from the code. <laughs> Other point, leave in direct elaboration via elaboration engines. So to try to do in an indirect way. So instead of uh, to put a, a piece of code which do the routing, write a piece of code which takes a routing rules and transform it in, in, in instruction. This, again, is another way to be a, able to handle the changes. Then, last point. OK, these are general idea. We can now propose an architecture for this hybrid translation frame. Then, when you have an, an idea of your architecture, you can validate the architecture by means of change scenario. So you have your project of the architecture. Say, OK, what will happen if I have to change this? And you look and see how many parts you have to change, see if it's possible. Do for the various change scenario, and in the end, you say, OK, my architecture is validated for copying with the changes. OK, I don't know how many time I have. I, I know. So I just, uh, I'm not uh, too, too a long time. So this is the, our uh, one pos possible architecture. <coughs> so very easily, we have uh, the machine is structured in this way. The data, there is uh, some receive module which receives the request and then store in some buffer. And then there is a scheduler which decides which request to. Uh, 
Then the requests are sent to some translation unit. We have a, a lot of translation unit in parallel, obviously, because uh, we have to process a big amount of data. The unit uh, which use, so the, the work of the unit is based on this constant data. So the routing rules uh, should be some data which is constant, uh, put uh, perhaps in some database because it's complex, but it will be used uh, by the unit. And then the translating block. Translating block means uh, you should have a translating block for any translating function that you have found in the requirement. So you have to organize in this way. And they are stored somewhere, they are ready to be used. And then the unit will do the pass there. Then we have uh, this domain, the consumer. Since uh, the routing should be decided knowing which are the available consumer, we need the information on them. And since uh, this information can change dynamically, we have an operator to update it. This is a system which has no real-time problem, so there is no need to a sensor detecting when the printer center stops. It's enough to have a person which would say, okay, now I'm going to stop this one, I do something and inform the system. And these techniques to have a representation of the context, how it can change is the typical techniques to cope with the context where changes. Okay. And then we have the architecture of the translating unit. We have this translating block which corresponds to the translation function. The scheduler sends a job to be done in translation. We have a module which is the define a process to perform the translation. And produces some structure which is said what to do on the received data using the translating block. It's a kind of the definition of the process to be performed. Then, oh, sorry. We have a, a kind of engine which takes this process and performs and executes it using the routing rule and using the information on the available consumer. In this way, we have a Okay, someone can say this is quite indirect and not efficient. But uh, since uh, if we have uh, to change something, we have uh, just uh, to go in this part uh, and change a few lines, decide which how is the new process. For example, in the case, uh, the case that was not able to cope, that uh, the data was already uh, processed, we have uh, just uh, to the routing. Here there is uh, some line which say the process made by this, this, this last step routing. We just change say, the process is only by this step. And so the change is quite uh, obvious and immediate. OK, this is one proposal for an architecture. Then we can do the robustness analysis with respect to changes. So we uh, see which can be the possible change scenario, apply to this architecture, and decide uh, and see if uh, is able to cope with this change. If the results are quite good, we say, okay, this is architecture is quite good. We can then give another one and say, do the same analysis, say, okay, this is less good or this is better. And so we have an architecture which is able to cope with the changes. Okay, one example of this change scenario. We wanted to enrich the output data with some derived information. So we have the output data, we want to add something which can be computed using this data. Uh, this is the case uh, to introduce a report uh, with a printed mail. So one that simple case which took six months. So at the, the level of the domain, we just uh, we have the domain of the output data. We have to enrich with this operation which computed the derived operation. At the requirement level, we just we needed to add two translating functions. One which added this derived information, and another one which converted this uh, enriched data to some other data which can be sent to the consumer. So just add two functions, just change a, a, a composition to introduce a new translation. To the design, we just needed to add two translating blocks corresponding to two functions and do very little change in the generation of the process. So at least for this change scenario, our architecture is able to cope. We can go on and examine the other changes. Okay, so this is our idea of 
an approach of a design developing for change in the particular case of the hybrid translation frame. Obviously, this is very recent work. We have been proposed the problem just before Christmas, and so we have uh, something more to do. First of all, design and analyze other architecture, that is. Uh, then consider the problem of performance. Uh, to do this kind of analysis, we have uh, to introduce uh, some more information, cannot be done in general, because in this hybrid translation frame, there could be cases where we have a few input data, but are which are just very large, very also huge. For example, the hybrid mail system, you have, uh, you have uh, each day, you arrive one or two, three input data, but they are giga and giga of uh, uh, byte. Or you can have a large number of small input. The big brother will have uh, to examine his SMS, uh, email, which are very small, but uh, a huge number. So the performance analysis has to be done, uh, say, OK, under this case, under this case. And that is something we are going to do. Also, if in general, in this uh, uh, translation, hybrid translation frame, there is not a big performance problem. So for example, this system works, uh, so takes one day to handle one job is not a problem. And then the most uh, important point, uh, propose a developed method encompassing the idea that I've presented for this uh, case, method which use the UML, because uh, we think that the UML is a good way to document everything, and using the so service-oriented approach. Since a service-oriented approach as a, as a technology which makes it easy to compose this process, we want to propose a method based on this. But uh, we want to propose a method based on this idea, taking into account all the development process. This company is going to do something in that they are working on this so, but uh, they do just to say, OK, instead of the C uh, code, just to put some web service, some BPL, BP. Uh, OK, this uh, is not the way. You have to, to consider everything from the beginning to be able to use in an effective way also the SOA project. So can offer the technology just to compose this process, to add this translating block and change the combination of them. But you have to. This translated block should have uh, been derived from the analysis of the domain of the requirement. Not the OK, conclusion. So I don't know how many times I spoke. <laughs> so we have uh, proposed a way to tackle the problem of coping with the changes, so making system robust with respect to the change. Changes can be of different nature. We have uh, proposed three categories of changes. The overall idea is develop for changes. So the problem of changes should be in your mind from the very beginning, not just after we have finished everything. Our developing for change approach is based on old and new ideas, going up, uplifting the classical design for changes. And we have worked this idea in a specific set, setting, the hybrid translation case seen as a problem frame which, in our opinion, is the right level between generality specificity. So not uh, too general to say the problem of change in general, not even too specific, just we have uh, an example, a case study. And all our work is motivated by a real big problem of a real big company. And uh, the hybrid translation case is the starting point for a doc development method, where this general idea of developing for change will be put uh, embedded in a method based on UML and so on. OK, so this is finished. Questions? Uh, this is still consistent with you and you and Angelio. You and Angelio has always had this philosophy. When the requirements change, in the software development or maintenance or any uh, part of the process is supposed to follow. Uh, if something changed, you're supposed to have the evolution idea. Is this whole approach still the same philosophy? Yes. So, so, yes. so, so in this case, we trace the changes from the domain all uh, from 
in all the part. Uh, not even from the requirement, we say, okay, from the domain, because sometimes the changes in the domain and the requirement just change as a consequence. Uh, yes. In this work, do you think you'll be able to take advantage of existing tools, like ML tools, or really need to build new ones? No, I think we would like to base it to existing tools. For example, for SOA together with ML and other, for example, we have a, um, some connection with the um, Oracle, that the Oracle now is proposing a very rich suite uh, of tools uh, from SOA, with UML, without, with other, f and so we would like to use uh, existing tools. Just also because uh, we, in this case, we don't need uh, any formal analysis, uh, just uh, we need uh, the tools which support uh, mo model-driven approach or transformational approach or engine, for example, rules engine uh, and so on. Uh, the last few years, we started pushing this uh, mainly uh, through uh, and inspired by National Science Foundation. Uh, its uh, cyber physical system is a uh, is a following step uh, of embedded systems. Uh, I don't know whether you are aware of this uh, PCAST. Uh, report in 2000, which was published in 2007, which looked through the NITR and the investments in the country. It's about 3.6 billion dollar uh, per year, and they looked, evaluated the overall portfolio of investment, and uh, and basically the conclusion was that uh, the number one national priority should be cyber physical systems. Now, what is it? Uh, uh, we all know embedded systems. Embedded system means that you do computing and communication inside a physical environment. The, the typical question <clears throat> uh, what comes up in embedded systems, uh, and particularly embedded software, uh, that uh, uh, what does the physical environment do to the software development? Uh, how do you have to adopt your software development strategy from requirement specification to verification uh, uh, such uh, that it conforms to the, uh, to, the, to the overall pressure that are coming with, uh, the, uh, with the interaction of a physical environment? Of course, a lot of things, actually, I will talk about the details on that. Uh, a lot of things relate to time models. Now, the <coughs> Uh, the cyber physical system we use uh, is different in a sense that it looks both sides, not only the software sides, not only what the physical environment does uh, to uh, software development, but also what embedded information processing networking does to the physical environment. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the impact on both sides is huge. Uh, in a cyber physical system, basically we tell that the interactions are so strong between the two parts that functionalities are emerging through uh, the interaction of the physical and the cyber components, the networked physical and computational components. Uh, and indeed, uh, in that sense, it doesn't make, uh, doesn't make too much relevance to talk about that a particular function is coming now from the computational part or from the physical part, simply because uh, they mutually support each other. Uh, therefore, these artifacts really need to be co-analyzed, co-verified, co-designed. So that's, that's, the, that's the whole aspect of it. Now, uh, in that sense, of course, cyber physical system covers a tremendous broad area because airplanes, cars, uh, all, everything what system industry is doing these days can be considered a cyber physical system. The, the, the whole issue though here is not uh, whether we can build cyber physical system, but to look into uh, what are those core issues uh, that are popping up in 
many of the applications domains that was the was the shared science based uh, in this system category and uh, uh, and, and if I look the, uh, the history of what happened in, uh, in the last few years uh, in the US uh, at least, uh, after the PCAST study came out in 2007, uh, then uh, uh, th there was a, an avalanche of, uh, of NSF workshops, uh, national roundtable uh, that finally went to the point that NSF last year started uh, cyber physical system program. Uh, this is now size declared biggest program uh, at NSF. It continues on the, uh, the next year. There will be a $50 million investment in this program. DARPA started coming out uh, with cyber physical, uh, physical system program. The Navy came out actually with, uh, in the last uh, August, several calls that uh, related to this. So I think that, uh, that altogether there is a, a really remarkable momentum that is building up. Uh, just this month in April, uh, there will be the first international conference on cyber physical system. Uh, there is a CPS week. All of this will be in Stockholm. Uh, I, I just got the note from, uh, uh, from the local organizers that now the CPS week has nearly 500 uh, participants, registered participants. Uh, so it's, it's, it's evolving really nicely. Uh, there is a big discussion with our European friends whether this whole area is just politically conceived and, and is basically renaming the embedded systems or not. We believe that it's not. Uh, uh, but certainly to work out uh, what, what are the unique issues that belongs to this area uh, will, will happen in the next, uh, next few years. So that's what I mean by cyber-physical <laughs> system. So sorry for the, uh, the surprisingly long answer uh, to this uh, obvious question. Now, uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, an issue which uh, I think it's illustrative to uh, uh, what the cyber physical system mindset can bring uh, to the table uh, when you are talking about uh, such a mundane issue as verification. And uh, uh, what I will do is that uh, go through on an example uh, and discuss uh, uh, what are the verification challenges that are coming from heterogeneity. Uh, in cyber physical systems uh, and uh, why we don't handle it. And then uh, I will go to another topic, uh, which is an illustrative example in, uh, in my view, uh, based on the work what we are doing, that, uh, that how the classical verification problem could be handled in a cyber physical system way and what does it put on the table. And then I will end up with talking a bit about a model this design tool chain that uh, we started building up in Amuri uh, a few years ago. Ethan was still there, you remember. And where is it now and, and uh, how, we, uh, how we start uh, folding into that tool suite, uh, that uh, whole CPS point of view. So that's basically what I, uh, what I thought would be interesting. So this is a cyber physical system. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, in that uh, Muri. Uh, it's uh, Muri for the uh, European friends. is the multi-university research initiative. It's a DoD program. It's typically five years, one million dollar per year, uh, one and a half million dollar per year these days. So in that Muri, what we have with uh, Berkeley, uh, CMU, and Stanford, uh, we are dealing with. Uh, a quadrotor helicopter, and we are uh, what was built by Claire Tomlin at Berkeley. And uh, the whole MURI is about uh, building up a, a pure model based design environment uh, for the flight control system uh, for that quadrotor. Uh, it's not a single quadrotor, but a network of these. And, uh, and, the, and the point there that uh, uh, that uh, let, let's see 
uh, what are the boundaries what we can achieve uh, in certifiability if you use model-based techniques, end-to-end -end model based techniques. So that was uh, the original concept uh, what, the, uh, uh, what the project started. Now, of course, uh, when, you, uh, when you pursue model-based design, then, uh, as you know, uh, come the, the basic mantra of model-based design, which is that uh, uh, we manage the complexity uh, in the design such that we create these abstraction layers that Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli likes to call platforms. We create these abstraction layers uh, in the design flow, and these abstraction layers uh, handle aspects or design concerns, and uh, we progress in the design such that we address these concerns and then see what happens. So obviously in this uh, uh, application context, uh, the quadrator is a physical platform, so there, is, there has to be a, a layer of physical abstractions and as you may certainly recognize that uh, that block diagram is just a picture from Simulink. Uh, and indeed Simulink has the appropriate continuous time models that are nicely fit to describe the physical behavior of that system, the physical dynamics uh, of that system. And the physical dynamics is described such that there is a plan dynamics, there is a controller dynamics, the, co the connection between them. Uh, these diagrams are pretty deep. <coughs> and a whole lot of things can be done uh, when you do the design on that level until you come up with the, uh, with the acceptable physical design. Of course, the whole thing is uh, will not stop there because uh, that quadrotor uh, has uh, specifically two embedded computers uh, and uh, communication links so they can talk to each other, they can talk to the ground station. Uh, therefore, there is another layer of abstraction which deals with the software. Uh, some parts uh, of that uh, design here, basically the controller dynamics, are repackaged and repackaged to turn them into a software uh, uh, system. Uh, that software system uses a, its own abstractions. It's a platform, again, a design platform. Uh, there is a model of computation which is adopted there. There is a, a component concept, uh, a composition concept there. And you end up with a component architecture which will implement one way or other the physical dynamics uh, which is there. Uh, clearly, <coughs> that's a very different kind of. Uh, design platform, right? Because uh, if you just look the basic things, the time model uh, is logical time uh, in this abstraction layer. And of course, it doesn't stop there that because you have, when you go one layer deeper, uh, then uh, all of this componentized uh, software architecture, what you ended up with, which again uses logical time, will be mapped onto some kind of hardware platform. And that hardware platform indeed has these. Uh, uh, PC-104 PC computer and that Stargate, uh, the, the communication links and the robot sticks uh, with a bunch of other kind of uh, hardware component and that, uh, that gives you basically the, the underlying hardware environment. Uh, that hardware environment, that hardware platform also is modeled. Uh, the models, again, what you use in that case are totally different. They use a different time model. This is a discrete event time model. Uh, and, and finally, you end up with this overall design flow. So that's a cyber physical system. It really doesn't make any sense to, uh, to talk here uh, uh, about separating too much or too rigidly the software and the hardware because the whole behavior, how that thing will fly, how it behaves, how safe is it, all coming out as the joint behavior of the uh, basically as a result of the interaction of, uh, of the hardware, uh, I mean of the software, or computational, or better to say, and the, and the physical platform components, right? Now, uh, le let me address here uh, the classical embedded software uh, view, how the embedded software guys look at the verification problem. Uh, the embedded software guys tell that, well, uh, this control software here, is a real-time software because it's embedded in a physical environment. And what we really need to understand, uh, what makes that software, what I 
specify in logical time a real-time system where that real-time system fits into the physical constraints of the physical dynamics which is imposed on it. Uh, Joseph Sifakis wrote a beautiful paper about this. Uh, it was published in the special issue of uh, IEEE, uh, Proceedings of the IEEE in 2003. Uh, and uh, he basically uh, looked into uh, the, uh, the verification problems in real-time system. And he posed the problem uh, the following way. Uh, when you build re a real-time system, you basically build reactive programs. Uh, so F is a reactive program, uh, and uh, clearly F as a reactive program, which is the embedded software as a reactive program, is nothing else than a mapping between a logical time inputs and logical time outputs. Symbolically, uh, that F is described as T is, of course, the logical time axis, as, as a mapping between the input set, uh, which includes all conceivable logical time inputs, and the output sets, and of course it's a, uh, it's a full power set, so because you, can, uh, you have to allow multi determinism. Now that's the software model here. Now when you start operating uh, it in a real-time environment, then you need an underlying computational platform which instantiates that software in real time, right? That's, uh, that's what actually happens. The result of that real-time instantiation, uh, which meaning again that, uh, that the programs are packaged into interacting components, uh, there is a scheduler uh, which schedules the execution of these individual components. And that scheduler schedules when the computation resources, communication resources are added uh, to the uh, software and to the computation. Uh, and there are some time constraints, of course, related to this, under which it has to be done. So in that case, the F is magically uh, turning into an FR, which is now a real-time system. Uh, and in that real-time system now, what, uh, what happened is that you change the T uh, to TR, uh, and you uh, and FR now is performing the mapping on the uh, on the real time axis, right? And then basically uh, you have the question: When I did the real time implementation of it, when I uh, when I did the mapping, when I did the scheduling uh, of all of the resources, didn't I mess up something? And that's basically the real time system verification problem. Uh, based on this model, uh, he divide it up into two steps. One is to check the correctness of the implementation. And the implementation, he tells, is correct if you do a, uh, a stripping function here, uh, which takes the real-time uh, timestamps uh, from the input and the output and turns it into logical time, that's psi, and see that that behavior, what I gain after stripping of all of the real-timeness and preserve just the logical time, basically the ordering, is element of that specification, what I got here. And uh, if that's the element of this specification, which has a bunch of non-determinism, then, uh, then the implementation is correct. Basically, all of the non-determinism, what you have in the logical time, is serialized. It's precisely ordered, uh, but still, uh, that has to be that trajectory, that instance of the trajectory has to be one instance of what you specified here, right? And that's a clear correctness. Can you elaborate a little about these two yeah, functions? Yeah. Oh, uh, these are basically, if, uh, from mapping wise, are the two, the, exactly the, uh, the yeah, two. I understand the, 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 the principles of it, the, uh, but uh, uh, what can these functions do? So how, how far can the delay be, or is there a specific? No, that's, uh, OK. So that's the other part of it, it that one, pa one part is just the correctness testing. That that behavior here, what you generated, uh, is part of the set of behaviors that were specified here. But the other part is the timing behavior, right? And the timing behavior in general is nothing else that you have to do a timing analysis to test whether the P property, the set of P timing properties are satisfied or not. That 
P timing properties don't do anything with this one, right? Because it doesn't understand that, right? So, so this is a decoupling of, of the timing and the uh, correctness. That's right. So that's, that's Joseph's uh, uh, conceptualization, and that's a, that's a very, uh, very clean structure. And basically, the timing analysis, obviously, that, that P basically tells that uh, the, P, uh, the, the P establishes a relationship on the real time axis between uh, the set of inputs and the set of generated outputs, and it just has to check whether whatever property you defined on these pairs are satisfied or not. So that's how the. I'm sorry for it. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting point. Uh, this function f over there, uh, so the top function f, uh, if the, this is timing sensitive, so if there is a clock in the logical implementation, and I do some delay stuff, then uh, can it happen that uh, that, that uh, the, 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 when the, the, the logical function says, I do this output now because of that, that input, and uh, after, uh, when it's only working after some delay, then it decides to do something else because it's later. So the, some internal clock deadline appeared. So if you turn it into an event. The question is basically, can F be timing sensitive at all? Or do, does it need some restriction on what does it know about time? So I, I believe that uh, this is a reactive program. Therefore, it can know about events. It knows about events, but not about But time. not about times, not about the real time. That sounds really uh, there, there is event, uh, there is a sequence ordering. It understands ordering. It understands partial orders. Yeah. Uh, but doesn't understand full orders or complete orders. Sounds reasonable. Now, uh, so, so okay, that's uh, the beautiful paper. I really, I really can recommend to take a look at it. Uh, now, of course, then uh, the question is that if we pose the overall verification problem this way, uh, that we. Uh, look the logical time model, and we see whether uh, the real time model complies the logical time uh, model, so it's consistent between the two, and the real time model has the timing analysis. Uh, the, the reasonable question, uh, what you ask for, where these requirements are coming from, right? You can pose very nasty conditions here, uh, but, but really, that's. Uh, that's what we need to ask. Where, where does it come from? Well, in cyber physical systems, obviously, these are not dreamed up. In cyber physical systems, uh, these properties are coming from another domain, which is the physical domain, uh, where essential system properties, what are these essential system properties? The physical properties. And examples for that stability, safety, Stability, you know what are, these are classical dynamic system concept. Say uh, stability, you know that the system uh, uh, cannot, uh, uh, cannot start generating energy. Uh, safety means that you draw the reachability sets and you guarantee in the state space that's, uh, that there are safe regions what, uh, where, uh, and the system will always remain in those uh, subspaces. And also performance. Uh, all of these essential properties are ex expressed in terms of the physical behavior. So what you are really interested in the, in the quad rotor, that you cannot destabilize the quad rotor, it cannot start wobbling, uh, that it will not collide to the other quad rotor. And actually, I, I must tell you that Claire uh, Tomlin has a pretty fantastic demonstration of what uh, she just saw that uh, show our last review. Imagine that there are four quadrotors, uh, four students drive every one of them, and they try to get them collide uh, in the open air. And they are not willing to collide because there is a, uh, there is a sense and avoid algorithm, uh, and, uh, uh, and they can deconflict each other and make the appropriate maneuver. Uh, of course, you might ask whether can you do that beyond four? And that's a different question. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, so, but, but, but again, the, the original, uh, coming back to the original question, uh, here, the timing analysis obligations and the challenges are coming in cyber physical system from this area. 
So obviously, it's, uh, it would be really interesting to see that. Uh, why don't we try to articulate uh, in that overall verification structure immediately the cyber, uh, I mean the physical layer, and start from the physical layer and see what happens. So we can refine this model. <coughs> I use the same formalism what, uh, of course, Joseph is using, except that now we are talking about two functions here in the physical domain. One is P, which is, uh, you know, there is a natural composition. We are talking about plants and controllers. So there's a plant part, which has one kind of dynamics, and there's a controller part, which is the other kind of dynamics. Yeah. When, when uh, you did this uh, separation between controller part and physical part now already, uh, wouldn't that be even uh, sometimes interesting that at a certain, point of, a certain point of development we don't even know which is part of the software and which is part of the physics? Uh, uh, <coughs> well, the <coughs> at least in my story, uh, what's going on that uh, when we continue with the implementation, we implement FR, so we implement the controller yeah. part. Uh, the physical system part, uh, uh, sticking with my original story, the physical system part is the dynamics of the airframe, the quadrotor. And the controller has its own dynamics. Uh, that dynamics is a discrete dynamics, as it turns out, but that discrete dynamics is turned into a continuous time dynamics through sample and holds, right? Uh, and uh, ultimately, you have a continuous dynamics on that layer. That's, that's how it's all implemented. But there is a, there is a very well-defined subset there uh, where I need to deal with turning it into a computational implementation. That makes it into cyber physical, right? So that, that whole thing here is a cyber physical system structure because part of it is, uh, or <laughs> there's a total physical aspect of the overall problem, and there is a pure cyber aspect of the overall problem. Yeah. So I was trying not to ask this, <laughs> but now I can't go further without asking. So if you go back to the previous slide. Yeah. So I've always had a problem with this, that the, the software model, I look at that as the equivalent of what we call an idealized solution. It doesn't include the time, right? But then the timing has now got to include what we call functional timing requirements, as well as the performance timing requirements. Right. And they, they're different. Um, so how do, I, how do I cope with that in just putting them in the, the timing analysis? Because they behave totally differently. Um, so if I've got a functional timing requirement, it's something that is part of the actual behavior. Normally, the performance timing is something where I can't achieve the idealized uh, thing depending on my model, and I'm making some allowances. So I usually do different things to handle them. And I, I've never understood how I do that just by, by putting it in the lower function then. No, uh, so if, uh, let's just stick with the example. So uh, if, uh, if you come up with the, uh, with the overall physical abstraction uh, layer and you expressed uh, your controller as a continuous dynamics, then uh, there is, there is a step which is totally in the time domain and in the physical domain and which is purely mathematical, where I try to do a transformation in which I transform that continuous uh, time domain behavior into a, uh, into a discretized time behavior. There's an established system theory behind, which maintains uh, or describes precisely the, uh, the conditions under which you preserve properties, or you know what happens with the properties. And usually just sequence. No, that, it's, a, it's a real time. It's, it means that you turn basically your, uh, your continuous time system into a discrete time system. There are time stamps, usually uh, regular, uh, so, uh, so uniform sampling intervals. But everything is timed, right? But it's totally idealized. Uh, so if you, uh, it's, if you refer to that part, uh, then, then basically what, uh, what happens at this point that from uh, the specification here, 
uh, which is coming from the, uh, the dynamics of the system, I come in here and derive a totally idealized real-time picture how that behavior, what I implement here on a platform, needs to idly behave. But that will not just not happen, right? And it will not just happen because, uh, because we have all of these things. We have scheduling, we have communication, we have all sorts of conflicts. So there will be jitters and all of that stuff. Uh, and that's what will I talk about. Okay. So you, and you put that in there? Uh, that's right. Okay. okay. So, uh, so what? Uh, so uh, after that refinement, what uh, what's coming further is that uh, that really what uh, what would be interesting if I understand precise, uh, precisely from uh, that physical behavior, what really are the timing requirements? what my essential properties, which is not the timing requirement, don't forget it. My essential requirement is that the system needs to remain stable. That's an essential requirement. And I want to understand now, starting from that essential requirement, what does that mean in terms of timing requirements here? And that's a totally different story than to tell, yeah? Being stable, uh, can you describe that uh, in a very general form, or is uh, do you need uh, application-specific terms of what stability means? No, or stability is a very general. So you could. It's yes. Better... In this, in this layer, in the physical, in the layer of physical models, uh, system theory gives a very uh, precise the definition of stability. Okay. And that relates to Lyapunov functions, and you can derive uh, very explicitly that under what conditions a uh, dynamic system is stable. Uh, but that's how I will continue, actually, because, uh, because the, the whole point, uh, how can I do stability, is uh, how I want to, uh, that's what I want to do. I don't want to shoot down all of my points that you guys are driving me toward that. OK, uh, so what, uh, what's my wish list? Uh, you, you obviously, you see that uh, the point here is that it's, a, it's altogether a pretty nasty uh, verification problem. <coughs> and particularly because uh, I really want to do uh, the verification, not the timing requirement here. It's a cyber physical system. What I want to verify is that my system is stable. And I want to verify that my system is safe. I will always stay in all of my trajectories into, into the safe uh, subspace. Uh, I also would like to do the following. I want to get robustness against implementational changes and uncertainties. Implementation means that when I'm starting from this idealized uh, dynamics picture and I'm going down here, there are all sorts of nasty things that I'm doing on the way. And it would be so lovely uh, to know that uh, my system design gives me enough robustness uh, that uh, my overall system, the quadrotor, is pretty insensitive to fault-induced reconfiguration of software, software and hardware. What does that mean? It means that when I do the reconfiguration, I mess with the time, right? I can do the reconfiguration. Everyone can do reconfiguration. But what the real problem is that reconfiguration start injecting timing uncertainties in the behavior. You cannot get away from that. Uh, I uh, want to... Uh, know that my overall implementation or, or my overall system design is robust against network uncertainties. I can tolerate packet drops, delays uh, that are coming from network uh, collisions. Okay. And overall, uh, uh, it would be so nice, and on the top of it, I would be able to decrease the the overall verification complexity. 
uh, all right. So uh, let me then uh, take another look of this uh, using uh, uh, the, the, the same uh, figure, but a, uh, uh, a little bit differently. Uh, everyone is changing compositionality, uh, both in system design and in verification. Fortunately, uh, when I tell everyone, uh, there are major groups, design concerns, where people are working and understand a whole lot about compositionality uh, uh, in their domain. So if we look at the physical uh, design, uh, the dynamics can be described in the physical domain, in the continuous time domain, uh, using components. It's a behavior-oriented description of the uh, physical dynamics. So you have n components and continuous dynamics behavior. As uh, Joseph Sifakis would tell, then, then I have some glue. And when I have all of that glue, I have a compost system and uh, they are essential properties uh, related to stability, safety, and performance, and they are a fantastic amount of results, compositionality results. Just refer to linear system dynamics, right? Beautiful compositionality results there. Abstractions here, continuous time, uh, functions, signals, flows, all of that. That's, that's the whole uh, design concern. Software, same. Uh, we have uh, uh, component behaviors in logical time, glue, composition. Uh, there are properties like deadlocks, different invariants, state invariants, security properties. We know uh, how to build up the whole science here. There are abstractions, logical time, concurrency, atomicity, ideal communication, uh, universal algebra, all of that good stuff. That's what happens uh, in this layer. There are good compositionality out uh, here as well. And the same story is here, uh, which is the systems layer, uh, the, basically the Harvard-ish uh, kind of things. Uh, again, the difference is that uh, that's major, that this is a discrete time model. Uh, the properties are timing, power, security, fault, tolerance, and so forth. Discrete time abstractions, discrete delays. We talk here about scheduling. Uh, uh, resource management, that's, that's what, where the whole science is built up. Now, of course, the issue is uh, that although we have on these areas uh, nice formalism, mathematics, and nice compositional results, when we build the cyber physical systems, uh, there is usually an assumption that the, con uh, the continuous dynamics guys really uh, want to forget about what are the implementational side effects of all of these things that are coming on the way when they take the continuous dynamics of the controller and implement it, right? Uh, therefore, they remain compositional until everything down here provides those conditions what they expect there. They have compositionally results, uh, let's say, in stability. Uh, when you mix continuous dynamics with discrete dynamics, but they don't have compositionally results in otherwise. So uh, they cannot handle, let's say, the quantization side effects because that brings in nonlinearities. So that's, that's obviously a, a one major problem. Uh, you have other major problems, of course, here. And ultimately, these assumptions uh, uh, will, uh, will will create trouble if they are not satisfied because at the end of the day, when you take some parts of that model, you do the implementation, you go back, embed it into the continuous time, and all of these assumptions, if not satisfied, then, then you will have a major trouble. <clears throat> so indeed, that's the, just the, uh, the, the details of this trouble. So control dynamics is developed without considering implementation on the uh, uncertainties such as word length, clock accuracy, uh, and uh, uh, software architecture models are developed without explicitly considering system platform characteristics, even we proudly abstract out all of that stuff, right? Uh, that's how our language is developed, and 
and, uh, and the whole superstructure in that developed. The interesting thing is if you look at, for example, the car manufacturers, um, they of course do it the same way. They first build the cars, then they define the function, which they call well, yeah. the software design, and then they throw it over to the software developers, uh, and they implement it, and, uh, uh, and they, they, they build a platform on it. And, and, uh, for a long time, there was a lot of effort built always when they mapped it to the software design, the platform design, where they have not been able to neglect these uh, effects of the platform. Yeah. And now recently they started to do, uh, to do this mapping by constructive techniques to make the delays and things like that deterministic, uh, which simplifies the, to, uh, the understanding of these effects. They cannot be neglected, but they can be better understood. Yes, that's, uh, that's what, uh, that's certainly, I won't deal with this part, but certainly one approach, uh, one approach what you can handle this is, that instead of uh, doing this separation, Ethan wanted to write a paper about this, uh, which was, he wanted the title that concerns about separation of concerns. Right? Sounds like a good title too. Yeah, so, uh, the, so it was, uh, uh, it's counterintuitive, but indeed one way to address these problems is not abstracting out the side effects, but abstracting in uh, properties from the other layers such that you can, uh, that you can, you can, you can drive this and understand. But indeed, that's exactly the problem what comes with it, that the car manufacturers, for example, want to have control architectures that can be carried over to other platforms, uh, because the platform's life cycle, uh, now the big move to us, uh, toward the multi-core, is different than the life cycle what you come up here with, right? And, uh, and indeed, all of that problem, which all relates to that these assumptions are not met, just collapses this uh, whole thing. So altogether, uh, what we end up with is uh, that, uh, that we will lack the compositionality across the layers. Uh, they are intractable interactions, they are unpredictable system level behaviors, emerging behaviors. Uh, if you do the full system verification, we all know that it's not scaling, so it's really a major problem. So basically what, uh, th th that's the issue, can we, uh, what can we do here? And of course, that comes to the basic rule of problem solving. If you uh, if, uh, if the going gets tough, then the tough changes the problem, right? Uh, so let's, uh, let's see uh, what can we do here. Uh, if you read, the, there was an uh, NRC study on dependable systems. And the NRC study conclusion was that uh, the only way to manage complexity is, not to, do, uh, is, is to not do it. Uh, and one way not to do it is that you start systematically looking simplification strategies and how to simplify this overall entangled mess uh, that are created here. And uh, uh, let me just select one particular approach here. There's a suite of approaches, I must tell, uh, that help uh, in this whole problem. Uh, basically, it helps through orthogonalization. And the orthogonalization means that we can use a classical system theory concept called passivity to decouple stability, which is one of the properties in dynamics, uh, from implementation in, uh, induced time variant delays. So if you think over that, uh, if the strategy is successful, that it would mean uh, that, uh, that if I design the system and I prove that it's stable, and I have good theories, uh, which is compositional theories for passive systems on the physical uh, layer, then all of my design preserve that property independently what kind of mess I create in the software implementation uh, with the schedulers and particularly with networking. Uh, all right, so that's, that's the next step and I will uh, briefly browse through elements of this whole passivity-based design uh, uh, 
uh, it's totally rooted in system science. Uh, so uh, it doesn't do anything with computer science in that sense. Uh, <clears throat> passivity, uh, passivity has a, a different kind of mathematical definitions, but ultimately uh, it means that uh, in the physical system layer, we are all in the physical system layer. A passive system only stores and dissipates energy, but cannot generate energy of its own. Okay? So a classical passive system is your dynamic system, which is built from resistor capacitors and inductors. Right? It's an RLC system. You can implement arbitrary dynamics with it. Everyone dissipates energy. And no matter how you uh, combine them together, it will never oscillate. Why? Because they cannot generate energy. They can just dissipate energy. It's a, it's a fantastic strong result. You know that they always have a Lapinov function. And, uh, and if you understand how to do these passive systems, uh, then, uh, then it's, a, it's a major deal. So passive systems also interact in a stable ma uh, manner. Uh, and this is the compositional result. Uh, if you connect them either parallel or in, neg in a negative feedback way, the overall system remains passive. Uh, so that's the recipe how I can build and maintain passivity compositionally. Uh, obviously, it doesn't have the serial uh, composition, uh, but uh, system science worked out all sorts of methods with which you can passivize systems. There are, uh, the, the whole area is quite rich uh, in system science. Uh, I will obviously not talk about that. Uh, Another thing, passive control theory applies to linear and nonlinear systems, and most importantly, continuous and discrete time systems. Even right now, there is an effort. We, we work in a team with this. Uh, some members of the teams are working on expanding uh, the, the passivity context, uh, context to hybrid dynamics as well. Uh, and obviously, uh, if you have the uh, passivity, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent thing to do control safer because, uh, yeah, because you know that the system will not uh, uh, oscillate ever. Here are the major milestones, uh, uh, how that whole theory uh, was developed. Uh, obviously, there was a big area when all of the continuous uh, analog filters were changed over to digital filters in the 70s. And, uh, and Fatface uh, did the first uh, large set of works uh, to develop the theory for the so-called wave digital filters. And basically, the wave digital filters were the method in which he explained that uh, if I approximate the filter characteristics using RLC type of passive elements, so I get a passive approximation of a dynamics. Then he provided a transformation called bilinear transformation with which that continuous time implementation could be transformed into a discrete time implementation, and it preserved the passivity. Now, the, the, huge, uh, the huge result of that was that that continuous time implementation, uh, I mean the discrete time implementation, he guaranteed also implementability, though there were no zero delay loops in it. That's an algorithm property. So just think about it, that you design an algorithm such that in the front end, you design it as a physical system with physical properties. You transform that uh, very deterministically into an algorithmic implementation. There are uh, freedoms how you implement actually the algorithm, so that so I, I, it's not completely automated. No, there, there, there are different branches of this group who, uh, who, uh, who have uh, who develop different passive structures that implement that dynamic characteristic. The wave digital filter was one type of structure, and that's totally deterministic. There is another branch which is the which was developed by Petzli in the 80s, which was the resonator bank-based implementation. Uh, that's also deterministic in the transformation, and the game preserved passivity. So these were uh, really the, uh, the major results that came out during the last three decades. Uh, uh, lately, uh, it was shown 
that, uh, that uh, the passivity results can also be applied to network systems. And particularly Niemeyer showed that if you do teleoperation, robotic teleoperation, through the internet, and the internet is important here because it has very nasty time varying delays. If you, use that, if, if you do that type of approach, then you can preserve the passivity of the overall dynamics. You cannot destabilize the teleoperated manipulator uh, with random delays uh, in this. And then our co-workers, who are, whom we work on this uh, joint project, they also developed that part of the theory, and, and now we have a, a quite well-developed foundation for this. Yeah? I'm missing the intuition about passivity, but presumably you don't get something for nothing here. The, the you sacrifice performance. <laughs> Sorry? You sacrifice performance. Okay, so can you give an instance of, of how that might manifest itself? In a As, uh, the, your, uh, your overall dynamics will be sluggish, or more sluggish mm -hmm. than what you would allow. Uh, so, uh, so let's see, uh, I, I will not show that, but one of the latest things what we are doing is that, uh, that you have these quadrotors and they uh, have to create uh, a geometric formation uh, such that you tell them, every one of them, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the required geometric shape, uh, what they have to create among each other and they have to do that such that they communicate across each other. So this is a consensus-based dynamics uh, algorithm, uh, what it does. It turns out that you can rephrase that problem, that distributed control problem, as a passive control problem. Uh, therefore, you can create a purely distributed controller uh, such that even if your communication links are falling apart, you lose pockets, uh, the delays are changing. The formation will not destabilize. Uh, of course, uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, that the performance, that means how rapidly you converge, uh, or whether you converge at all, is or cannot be impacted. Uh, it also not guarantees that the, uh, that the quadrotors will not run into each other. The only thing what it guarantees that uh, that you cannot destabilize the formation. Arguably, this is a pretty big thing because then you have other degrees of freedoms what you can use now for maintaining stability. That's what we work on uh, right now. And also, if you maintained stability, you maintained uh, safety. Now, what can I do with the performance? Uh, so the, these are basically the uh, the overall uh, steps. All right, so that's, uh, that's basically uh, passivity-based design. Uh, uh, so are these guarantees valid more in an asymptotic sense? Is that what you're saying, essentially? So that convergence will happen asymptotically? No, yeah. so, so the stability is absolute. You, you cannot destabilize the system. Uh, the, what I'm talking about, the convergence, is that, uh, that when, when I'm talking about formation, uh, then, uh, then the performance relates to how rapidly I converge to the desired formation. But, but when you say you cannot destabilize the system, that's in the absence of disturbances. No, it's, it, it, you cannot destabilize in the presence of disturbances. These disturbances are blowing wind and, and falling apart communication links. So uh, the, the system is... Internal system disturbances, <laughs> external disturbances. Um, well, if you, uh, no, the, so, so the system in principle is, it's like, can I destabilize an RLC network such that it can start oscillating? It's a physical impossibility. So, uh, so, so stability is, uh, is becoming an inherent property of that system design. What stability doesn't deal with, as, as you know, whenever I do verification, I always verify one property and I achieve compositionality only for one property. If I have other properties, then I need to look at that, uh, right? And what I'm talking about is one property, which is passivity, uh, uh, sorry, stability. Yeah. Well, are you sure that this will 
really work in context. Like the example I would bring to you is the failure of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which, by the way, wasn't very far away from here. And the bridge does not generate energy. I mean, it was a mechanical system, okay, but it was designed out of the equivalent of RLC type things. And, but the, the problem was that uh, there was no energy injection by the controller, but there was energy injection from the environment in the form of a wind. And it turned out that there was a resonance yeah, but it's, which, uh, it... which, which allowed a, a gain. So, so, I mean, there were physical oscillations which grew without bound and tore down the bridge. Yeah, but so, so, how do you reconcile that kind of uh, occurrence with, with the steer on your account? But it still didn't mean that the, that the bridge generated energy, right? No. Uh, it's, uh, it's just, uh, if, you, if you excite it in the resonance frequency, yeah. then uh, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, how to tell, doesn't increase the energy which is in it. Uh, it just... It's, uh, it's, it's again one property of the dynamics that the, that the inputs uh, started pumping in energy in that particular point. Then the, right, then but, the but I mean, is, is your definition of stability different than this? Because in, in, in that case, you did get physical oscillations of the bridge which grew to the point which destroyed the bridge. Yeah, but that, that doesn't mean that it became unstable. So you, you see, stability is not that, uh, stability is the concept that that the system start producing more energy at the output what uh, what it stored or what you put in and uh, uh, that was a totally legitimate behavior from the uh, from a passive totally passive system if you if you build a resonator uh, from an L L lnc component right then an ideal resonator you can pump in uh, energy and that and that resonator will resonate uh, but it's remaining stable, right? It's it's you didn't destabilize it. Yeah, this relates to a question I had, which is I, I didn't see anywhere in your models where you're modeling the environment. I see environment model. No, it's, there's a whole part of the uh, of the presentation which talks now about the modeling environment. But in terms of your levels there. Yeah. Um, are those incorporated as part of the models at those levels, or is it something else? So, uh, so just running through the whole thing, the uh, the modeling. So, if you understand, uh, if you understand how to how to do composition in the physical layer, and what kind of constraints you need to observe uh, in the physical layer, such that you end up with a passive system design you can build those constraints in your modeling environment. So we have now a modeling environment which understands those constraints. You cannot build, there is a strong restriction right now there because we have restricted it to linear systems. But the, the, this is more of a effort issue than principal issue. Uh, but the bottom line is that, these, uh, that with that modeling language and with those constraints, uh, your system is guaranteed to be passive remaining passive. When you take then the passive system and uh, you have your passive controller part of it and you refine it and you do a go to a digital implementation, you have the guarantee that my implementation cannot screw up the stability, no matter how badly I choose the implementation. It can totally mess up your performance. Right? Again, this is a uh, All right. Uh, yeah, we are. Uh, we are. Uh, let me let me just show you some uh, some elements. To it. Uh, I, I browse through how the uh, the whole thing goes. Uh, we really yeah. want to hear what you have to say, and uh, we ex uh, we accepted. Uh, let's say we synchronize yes. this point and accept the environment. The model exists; it works. Then we, we go on. Want to see what you have to say? To yes, that, uh, that's right. So uh, so basically, what uh, what happens now if if you have all of this passivity theory, you can, you can imagine that I can derive a, a set of basic components with which I can build these passive dynamics. Uh, these components will, know, uh, will, uh, will have elements such as the bilinear transform, uh, 
par and wave variables, uh, passive down and on up samplers, delays, par junctions, uh, passive dynamic earth systems, and so forth. That's, so you can imagine that these, I can create a set of building blocks is not unlike using RLC to build, uh, to define dynamics. Uh, after having that, uh, we can create a modeling environment. That modeling environment is modeling continuous dynamics. In that modeling environment, uh, I adopt all of these concepts with their precise mathematical, the precise mathematical definitions. And indeed, uh, we do our usual games that uh, that we built up the meta models for all of these components. Uh, we built in the, uh, all of the uh, compositionality constraints. And now we can build up uh, passive system designs. Uh, there are different aspects of it. And what you see here in that picture is, for example, uh, uh, a control system uh, where the contr a control system for a teleoperated two robotic arms. It's a, uh, it's a haptic paddle with which you can control two robot arms. That's, that was our test problem and, uh, and that uh, the control aspect has the, uh, the controller, uh, the, uh, the passive controller specification, the two plan system and there's that par junction type of things which is one of the mechanisms with which the control signals can be distributed. All of the communication across the controllers and the, uh, and the plants are happening through these wave variables instead of the usual things. So, uh, so it deeply it, it has a it has a deeply embedded concept of that that systems theory uh, thing. And with this, we built up uh, an overall implementation of the system. And let me just show you uh, uh, what uh, what was our test problem. Uh, here are the two robot arms. Here is the haptic paddle that can be uh, used. Uh, we had all of these elements uh, uh, put on uh, five laptops. Uh, there was a communication network. That, was, uh, that communication network was built such that uh, one of the laptops implemented the communication network because we wanted to play uh, with time varying delays. Uh, and packet drops and all of these things. And, uh, and in fact, the implementation was the conceivable worst real-time environment uh, where every one of these uh, uh, laptops were running Windows uh, and the controller was implemented in Simulink as a Simulink simulation. But it was a total real-time system because the signal flow through on it and, uh, and everything was linked together. And indeed, uh, after that, this is the nominal case when, uh, when, the, uh, when, the, uh, when we didn't turn in uh, the real bad part of the, uh, of the delays, communication delays. We were particularly interested in the communication delay effect. And uh, you see roughly that uh, the, uh, this is the position of the haptic paddle, which comes from the haptic paddle, and the blue and the red are showing the, the two robot arm, how faithful each uh, is following the, the haptic paddle position. And this is when we started messing up the delays by injecting all sorts of, uh, of artificially induced delays in it, and started in this, uh, uh, injecting even uh, persistent link interruptions. So, uh, uh, packets were lost, and we were not able to destabilize it, which is not a miracle uh, because the system cannot be unstable. But it was uh, really interesting from the point of view that uh, that uh, if you use passivity for this particular problem, uh, and if you are concerned about stability, the stability is now totally decoupled from the dynamic properties of the implementation. And that was basically the, the, most, uh, the most important test. Now, obviously, that's just one part of the overall story, what we, uh, what we are interested in it. And right now, actually, the, the overall tool chain, let me just jump there, uh, looks something like this. Uh, this is where we end up with. <coughs> 
Uh, so we have in the tool chain, uh, again, as I, uh, as I introduced at the beginning, that we are building up that, uh, that high confidence uh, model-based design tool chain. Uh, we use as a front end uh, the simulink state flow. And in fact, we use the simulink true time uh, extension, simulink and true time together. Uh, that's one element in the tool chain. Uh, we build up the dynamics here. And one extension is that, uh, that we can build up the dynamics such that we use that PANEX modeling language, which is that passivity-based design language, which constrains all of the dynamics, what you can imagine, to passive dynamics. You can start up the design that way. And after you specify the design that way, it will be translated into a simulink true time environment. And that's how your dynamics will be defined now. From the simulink true time environment, we had to do that because now we can simulate here, right? But it's still not the implementation. Uh, we take another translator and we take it to our other modeling language, which is what we call ESmall, which is again in our uh, tool, the uh, modeling tool GME. That ESmall is able to enrich uh, the whole design with a software, a software component model uh, and uh, all other things, such as uh, implementation platform models and deployment models. Uh, from this, uh, we uh, have a, a, another translation. And from this other translation, we can do schedulability analysis. And, uh, and after that, we have a suite of translators. And these translators uh, translate these models into uploadable code uh, to the uh, two processors. At this point, the bottom line is that we know that if we start from that path and we go through on that verification route, then uh, we end up with an inherently stable controller dynamics design. Up to now, there was one caveat that the whole passivity theory works such uh, that it assumes, that it allows, uh, it allows uh, time varying delays, but the delays had to be bounded. But uh, when will become a delay unbounded if the software deadlocks? So that's not solved. Therefore, uh, we work with Joseph Sifakis to, uh, to bring in his BIP tool suite. And, uh, and Joseph BIP tool suite uh, claims to have compositional uh, deadlocks uh, free uh, verification. And with this, we have not done that part of the work. Uh, if we do that, we will see whether we end up with, a, a, with an overall design flow in which we can guarantee that the system is stable, totally stable and deadlock free. Uh, there are big parts are still missing. We are obviously concerned with, with safety. And uh, the whole safety analysis part is not integrated yet. And that, that will be another step, and, uh, and so forth. So altogether, so what, what, uh, what, uh, le let me go back uh, uh, to the conclusion. That uh, I believe what's really interesting uh, in it, that if you look back, uh, the software verification task uh, in CPS, if you, uh, if you really ask, what is the property what I want to verify, uh, it may be much simpler. Because the verification obligations uh, for timing properties, uh, if, let's say, the only thing what you want to guarantee is stability, uh, can be eliminated or can be, de can be grossly simplified. Uh, so the answer uh, to that question whether CPS is inherently more complicated is non-trivial because with appropriate system design, you can create in the architecture such decouplings that, uh, that you can orthogonalize, indeed, design concerns against selected properties, not, uh, not everything once and for all. Uh, of course, this whole decoupling uh, requires a significant effort. And, uh, and, if, and if you in-depth look how uh, the system theory and the software part really place together. But I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile to, to look at. And uh, there are a bunch of other problems what we, uh, what we still need to do. 
So that's what my take on cyber physical systems. So I, th I believe that it's a very rich area and many ways model-based design is what enables it. Uh, and uh, and that, that interplay between systems, software, uh, and control engineering is just totally fascinating. Okay. One more. Yes. Uh, what you said in the last few sentences is just a really wonderful statement. I just learned from a two liar. I, for some reason, I never see anywhere so clear written in one of your slides that point out of the, the, the conflict, the misunderstanding. Uh, for many years between computer programmer and software people, hardware people, the people who work on application. This one of the slides you pointed at this two connection part. Uh, the arrow, you put a cross on it. Uh, I think it's about uh, yes. the seven slides of yours. So that two statement actually uh, lead us to understand the rest of what you're trying to say. Do you think it can bring it back? Here, we have a bunch of papers that lately we published on this. Here, right here. Uh -huh. Yeah, here. This two, this two places are the missing, uh, it doesn't seem too big, but that's misunderstanding between many communities for many years. And then from the application domain, and because not everybody's training or understanding across this boundary. It's this this two statement the assumptions are very very important. Yeah, of course that, that's that, that's the challenge in the education part that uh, that, that you that you sometimes has to find a way how to provide the groundwork for uh, for this uh, uh, for for the engineers that they are not separated into these two different camps. See, if you understand that than me, you can say that somebody else can understand. So that's that's a good part. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry that I burnt up so much of your time. I, I don't want to rush it, but um, in five minutes our bus takes us to the wine. So. Can, can, <laughs> oh, please, can we get asked I'm so out there here. one more question really fast? Yeah, but literally in five minutes the bus does come. How about so that's so that's ten seconds, I've finished the question. Yeah, yeah, Janos, so last year, September, there were a reuse workshop, software reuse workshop in Los Angeles. Yes. Can you tell us what's Remember in Los Angeles there was a software use workshop. You recall workshop? Are you supposed to be there? Were you? Yeah. I don't remember. No. You were there? I, I, I may not have been there. All right. Thank you. All right, I forgot. <laughs> Thank you.